All right. Turn to Romans chapter 10, verse 1. And the message for this morning is going to be six good reasons to go to hell. And uh, I guess you could say it's a little bit of a uh, sarcastic message, but uh, in reality there are six truly good reasons why somebody would want to go to hell and would not want to go to heaven. So that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. And if you're lost and listening to this, you need to listen to it. You need to consider what's being said. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now look at verse 3. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Okay? What do you see there? Well, you see the first and greatest reason why the majority of people go to hell. Self-righteousness. That's why, that's the first good reason for you if you are lost, uh, if you are self-righteous, if you think that you're a good person, then that's a Pretty good reason why you wouldn't want to go to heaven. And I'm going to show you more on that. Turn to Job chapter 35. Job chapter 35 verse 2. Back in the Old Testament. This is one that a lot of people don't see. As I was doing the research for this um, sermon, I came across this and I thought, you know, that's kind of interesting. Job chapter 35 verses 2 and 3 says, Thinkest thou this to be right, that thou saidst, My righteousness is more than God's? For thou saidst, What advantage will it be unto thee, and what profit shall I have if I be cleansed from my sin? Hmm. Did you know that that's the actual thoughts of somebody who's self-righteous? Think about it. Well, you know, if you die tonight, do you know for sure where you would go? Well, I think I'd go to heaven. Well, how do you know? Well, I've been a pretty good person. I th- I don't, I'm not that bad. Uh, well, then what's the standard? Well, I think that my good works are going to be weighed with my bad works, and if the good works outweigh the bad works, then I'm probably going to make it. Right? Well, then why did Jesus Christ die on the cross? If it's your works that get you in, your good works, your you know the fact that you're a good individual, why did Jesus Christ have to die on the cross? You know? There's a sacrifice there that God provided for man, and you say, I don't need that sacrifice, I trust myself. Then what you're saying is, your righteousness is better than God's. Now, you might not confess that, you might not profess that, I should say, but you believe it. In the back of your mind, that's what you believe. I don't need Jesus Christ's death on the cross, I'm going to trust my own good works. See, that's self-righteousness. And if that's the way you feel, well, I, you know, I don't know about this Jesus Christ stuff. I don't know about that. I, I, I'm a pretty good person. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't enjoy heaven, you know. And you're going to see why here in just a minute. But self righteousness, right there. Turn to Isaiah chapter 64. We're going to think, or we're going to see what God thinks about your good works. Isaiah 64, verse 6. It says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. By the way, you are fading as a leaf right now. Every day that you wake up, you're one day closer to death. (laughs) There's some positive thought for you. You know, and what does God think about your righteousness? It's like a filthy rag. You're not going to get up there and have your good works weighed out with your bad works. Your good works aren't judged if you're lost. Okay, your good works mean nothing to God. Your bad works are judged. And if you have one bad work, you end up in hell forever, for eternity. Okay, Matthew chapter 15. Got a bunch of scriptures to cover today, so we're not going to spend a lot of time just talking. I'm going to go through the Bible, 
because we are Bible believers here, and that's what we do. Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. Now, I'm going to show you a picture of a uh, the place you need to get to as a sinner, uh, one of the greatest women in the Bible. Matthew 15, verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed in, into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon, and behold, a woman of Canaan. Now, let me just stop there for a second. What is a woman of Canaan? Well, if you study in the Old Testament, the Canaanite people basically settled in Africa. So you have an African woman here. Okay, now she might have been Egyptian. Maybe she wasn't fully black. Maybe she was more of the look of an Egyptian. I'm not sure. But the point is the land of, of Ham, Canaan, is Egypt, Africa. Okay, you study the thing in the Old Testament. We're not going to get into that study. But this is a woman. She's not Jewish. She's African, essentially. Okay, but so this African woman comes and uh, says here, And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. Now that right there would be most, enough for most people to just, well, forget it then. But she continues on. And it says here, And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. By the way, if you're not dispensational, how do you interpret that? They're saved by looking forward to the cross. Yeah, uh-huh. Wrong. Okay, Again, listen to the message on non-dispensational Christian contradictions. Verse 24, but he, had, or I'm sorry, verse 25, Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Now, do you realize what he just called her? Now, it wasn't by name, but, you know, a female dog. I mean, that's a pretty vile thing to say to a black woman. That is what you call today a racist hate crime. <laughs> you know, here you got this Jew and this black woman comes to him asking for help and he says, you're a dog. And what does she say? What's her reaction? And she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. She didn't cry racism. She didn't cry hate crime. She said, yeah, I'm a dog, but how about some crumbs? I'm not a Jew. I'm not one of your chosen people, but hey, could you help me out? And look what Jesus says. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now that right there is a picture of the way you should come to Jesus Christ. You come to Jesus Christ and you say, here I am. And he looks at you and he goes, you're a dog. You're a sinner. You deserve to go to hell. And you say, truth, Lord. Hey, Brian, are you a dog? Yeah, truth. Mm -hmm. I'm no good on my own. You mean you don't think you're going to make it to heaven on your good works? Absolutely not. If I got to heaven and, and God said, I'm going to judge your works, I'd say, no, don't waste my time. I won't waste yours. Just point the way to hell. I'll go jump in. <laughs> I'm not going to make it on my good works, and nobody else is either. Okay? You take your place. And it's weird because Jesus Christ said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And yet you try to get the average person to acknowledge that they're a sinner, and they'll say, well, I don't think I'm that bad. <laughs> well, that's how you get saved. You say, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. You know? It's not a shameful thing to admit to God that you're a sinner. He knows you are, <laughs> you know? You're not telling him anything that he doesn't know, but you take your place. You say, I'm a sinner. But somebody that's self-righteous, that considers themselves to be a good person, they don't like that. They don't want to put themselves down, you know? I mean, I wonder how many, if this was in the 21st century here, here in which we live, I wonder how many black women would have taken the same approach as that lady did. I wonder how many women in general that were non-Jewish, you know? And by the way, it's not that the blacks are being singled out here if you're a black person. I'm a dog too, according to a Jew. Okay? A Gentile is a non-Jew, essentially. You know, so it's not that the Lord was singling out 
black people here. You're not a Jew, you're a dog. Okay? But uh, let's continue on here. Philippians 3 9. Just amazes me how people just can't stand the thought of being called a sinner. Uh, Philippians 3 9. Uh, Paul speaking here, he says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. When you accept Jesus Christ, his righteousness is imputed to you. His perfect sinless life is imputed to you, given to you. Okay? You're no longer self-righteous. It's kind of funny because the world tries to claim that Bible believers are self-righteous. We're not. We don't trust in our own righteousness. We trust in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the world sees that from a true Bible believer. And it offends them. You know, because they're self-righteous. They think that they're good. And they can't stand the thought of a Christian saying, a real Christian, saying, I'm no good. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ that I have. Okay, but that's that's the, the point there. So the first reason, good reason to go to hell is if you are self-righteous. That's a good reason. And if you aren't willing to say, no, I'm a sinner, well, you know, sinners, the only people in heaven are going to be saved sinners. Okay, not self-righteous people. The second good reason to go to hell is you can't stand the idea of worshiping Jesus Christ. Turn to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. Here you have John being taken up to heaven and he sees what's going on up there. Of course, this is the rapture, I believe. Revelation 4, verse 9. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne and who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying... Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Now look over at chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Worthy is the Lamb? What about the people? <laughs> nope, sorry. Uh, yeah, and verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, heard, heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth for ever and ever. Can you imagine being in church forever and ever? <laughs> Every day you get up and you worship Jesus Christ forever, for all of eternity. Now everybody here is smiling, but the, the, the you know, because to us we think, yeah, that'd be great. But to somebody who's self-righteous and out there in the world who enjoys sin, they don't like the idea of having to worship Jesus Christ forever. Every day? I got to go to church every day? Yeah. <laughs> and those crowns that you are given as a reward at the judgment seat of Christ, if you were saved, you'd get one. If Well, unless you were useless as a Christian. But uh, if you had a crown, you aren't putting it on your head and walking around with your with your chin up and everything. No, you're taking that thing and you're throwing it before the throne. The 24 elders there, but I believe probably also those Christians that are crowned probably are going to be doing the same thing, which is, you know, very interesting. Okay, but now let's go on to reason number three. The third reason, good reason, to go to hell is you're a coward and afraid to go against the flow of society. That's also a very good reason. That's why a lot of people don't want to get saved. What are my friends going to think? What's my family going to think? My co-workers. Uh, coward. That's what you are. You're coward. Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to show you about 
what the Bible has to say about being popular. It's kind of funny. I heard a story the one time this guy was at a youth conference and he said uh, he was saying about tattoos and ear piercings and and all the other stuff that teenagers, you know, are tempted by. And he said, uh, why do you do those things? He said, it's because you want to be an individual, right? Oh, yeah, 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 you know, yep. And he said, okay, everybody here that has a tattoo, stand up. And a whole bunch of people stood up. Everybody here that has a body piercing, stand up. Everybody here that has this, everybody here that has that. And before long, the whole crowd was standing. And he said, okay, look around. Are you an individual? No. You've conformed to the world. There's a lot of truth in that. Um, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, what that's saying is, the road to hell is very broad, and there are many people on that road. The vast majority are on the road to hell, and only a small minority are on the straight path, the narrow path. I'm sorry, that not the straight. Well, straight is the gate, but narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Not because it's impossible to find, it's just because you have to go against the flow. You know, one of the best things I ever heard, most people illustrate this these two verses here with a wide road over here and a little narrow path winding through the woods, and I just think that this is such a good thing. That's why I'm telling it again. And I heard a preacher say the one time, he said, no, he said, that's not it. Imagine a huge highway and everybody's going in one direction. And that little yellow line going up the, the center of that highway, that's the narrow way. And you've got to turn around and go against the flow of traffic. <laughs> you know, And that's a picture of the narrow way. And that's exactly it. That's a perfect analogy of the thing. You know, imagine walking the wrong way up a highway with a majority, or driving the wrong way on the yellow line on a motorcycle or something. That's essentially the Christian life. They say, are you against everything? You know, you're against this and you're against that and you're against, yeah. That's what going against the flow means, that you're going against it, you know. I'm going to get more into that here as we continue. Luke chapter 16 Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We're not going to go to John. We're just going to go to Luke 16. Luke 16, verse 13 through 15. Okay. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is a Bible word there for money. Uh, verse 14, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. <laughs> they didn't like it because he was kicking them. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Boy, you better get a hold of that one. I mean, there are some central truths in the Bible that if you can get figured out, you'll do pretty good in life. And that's one of them right there. That which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Get that thing figured out early on in your Christian life and you'll do well. But a lot of people don't. And they look and they, they, they look for, you know, preachers that have credibility. You know, how many degrees, how many earned degrees does he have? Well, the more he has, probably the more useless he is. You know, well, what about uh, the Christian celebrities out there, the contemporary Christian artists. Well, are they highly esteemed among men? Then they're abomination in the sight of God. Plain and simple. You can't serve two masters. All right. Uh, turn to James chapter 4 4. I'll show you this again. Again, another one that you should have memorized. And I know we've been over here quite a bit in different messages because it's such an important verse. James 4, 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. 
how does the world treat somebody? You know, we had an article recently here in our local newspaper about uh, Jack Chick, about Chick Publications, and they said that they are considered now a hate group. You know, out there trying to preach the gospel of Christ or Jesus Christ, and they're exposing errors in a lot of the false religions, the false new versions, and of course Catholicism, which is the greatest false religion that there is. And they're now considered a hate group. Well, that's exactly as it should be. If Chick Publications was popular and the newspapers were always praising them and they were, Jack Chick was being interviewed by Larry King and, and Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity and all the, I'd say, whoa, hold on a second. I'd stay away from Chick Publications. But the fact that they're hated and despised by the world lets me know, yeah, they're right. And I'm going to say something about somebody here. Amy Grant is a perfect example of James chapter 4, verse 4. She's given a show on NBC. Do you think that they would give a show to a Bible-believing Christian? Hardly. But you study Amy Grant's life sometime, and uh, av1611.org, you can get on there. They have a lot of good articles, one of which, um, without going into a big thing here on it, but this is important, I'll just say it, one of her videos, it, it has nothing to do with the occult at all, and all of a sudden she comes out in a red witch's gown and flashes two hexagrams on the palms of her hands. I got the pictures of it. And it has nothing to do with the occult. There's more to Amy Grant than most people realize. And she's a friend of the world. It's right there. You see, a lot of these modern, quote-unquote, Christian rock groups are doing what they call crossover albums. They do a Christian album, and then they do a world, a, an album for the world. And they look like the world, they're sponsored by the world, they're friends of the world. Uh-uh. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Okay? And I believe a lot of these modern Christian bands and things, I believe they're just as lost as any drunkard that stumbles out of a bar and lays in the gutter all night. Okay, I don't believe a lot of these people are saved, these modern Christians. Turn to Romans chapter 12. I'm going to show you another good one here. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable Service and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You are not to conform to the world. You are not to look like the world. You are not to act like the world. You're to be different. Okay. Uh, turn to John chapter 17. You know, it's kind of interesting. I heard a story, and I don't know if it's accurate. I don't know if it's actually true. If this actually happened. But uh, I heard there was a story of a soldier in the Civil War, and he was afraid of being killed. He was just scared to death. He didn't want to be there, but he, he was forced to join, you know. And so he was going to go out on the battlefield. And what he did is he put on Confederate gray pants and Union blue coat. And he thought, that way I'll look like both sides and I won't be shot. Well, at the end of the battle, he didn't come back to his unit. And they went out and they looked for him, and there he was laying dead, and he had Confederate bullets in his upper part of his body and Union bullets in his lower part of his body. <laughs> and that's a good picture of a Christian that tries to conform to both sides. You can't do it. No man can serve two masters. And a lot of these people, they, they call themselves Christians, and they say, well, I'm popular with the world. I can dress like the world and still be a follower of Jesus. No, what happened is you left Jesus a long time ago, if you're even saved, if you're a modern Christian. You left Jesus Christ a long time ago, and you haven't been serving him anywhere except for your little mind. And that's the truth. A lot of people, they think that they're right with the Lord, and they're not, because they've conformed to the world. They look just like the world. John chapter 17, verse 14 says, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. 
I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The way that you get set apart from this world is through sanctification. That's what set up, or sanctification means set apart. Okay? And the way that you are not conformed to the world is by study of God's word. This is what sanctifies you. This is what separates you when you begin to study the word and you begin to live according to this book. All right, Revelation chapter 21. We'll go there quick before we move on to the next point. And I'll show you about the fearful. Revelation 21, verse 8. Revelation 21, 8 says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So there you see where you're going to end up if you are fearful. If you are afraid of what the world's going to think of you, if you become a Christian, there's your verse right there. You're going to end up in hell forever because you were too big of a coward to get saved in this life. Okay, reason number four. Another good reason to go to hell is you enjoy filthy, dirty, dark environments. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 19. John 3.19 says, And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. It's kind of interesting. You watch any kind of videos at all of police pulling people over at night. What's one of the things that they do? They got that little spotlight there on the driver's side outside the window and they click that thing on and they shine it right over at the, the driver. The guy's swerving on the road, you know, weaving back and forth. The cop pulls him over, puts that light right on him. Why? His deeds were evil. And he's showing it by the light. Okay? And that, that drunkard in there, he doesn't go, oh, this is wonderful. I can see great now. This this light is, I really appreciate the light. He's in there squinting his eyes. and Oh, man, a miserable cop. Why? His deeds are evil. And, you know, he didn't want to be pulled over. And that's how it is. You start to reprove a sinner in this life that's lost. They don't like the light of this book. Turn to back to John chapter 12. Or forward, I guess. John chapter 12, verse 46. John 12, verses 46 through 48. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Okay, then what is your judge here in this life? Verse 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, lowercase w, hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. You know, there's a, there's a bunch of professing Christians running around this country right now saying that we don't have a perfect Bible. Uh, well, then how are we going to be judged? You just get up there and you say, well, you know, that portion of Scripture was not closest to the original autographs. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Right. Doesn't work. Right here's your perfect judge. King James Bible. This is it. Right there. And you're going to be judged by this book someday. Okay. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Galatians, Ephesians chapter 5. Psalm 119.105, by the way very well-known verse, says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Okay? Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. 
for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Remember what we read earlier? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Verse 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Proving there, by the way. You know what proving requires? It requires work. Well, I'm just going to be a Christian now. I got saved and I'm, I'm not going to read my Bible much and everything. No. Proving. It takes study. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Let's continue here. Verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Now, let me just stop there for a second. A lot of people say that this verse here, verse 12, means that you should never talk about the Illuminati or witchcraft or the occult or whatever. It's not what it says. Verse 13, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. It is perfectly acceptable and fine to reprove certain things in the occult. But I believe what's going on there in verse 12 is that you have to be careful when you start getting into research, you can start getting carnal. And you can start enjoying reading about these things. In the occult world, there's a lot of perversion. And there are just some things that you shouldn't read. Okay? You still have a body of flesh. You can still be messed up. I don't care how sanctified and holy you are. You can still get messed up. And there are certain things, if you've heard different messages of mine, I have studied the occult. I have studied a lot of the ancient Babylonian belief system. And there are some parts of it that are very perverted and very dirty. And I'm just simply not going to tell them. Okay? I don't need to tell every little point of it. And I don't need to study every little point of it. I've, I have studied witchcraft, but I'm not going to go be part of some witchcraft ritual sometime just to see if my research lines up. No. And, you know, I've had witchcraft books, and a lot of them I've burned. Just because the Lord convicted me, you don't need that to prove that witchcraft is wrong. Okay? Be careful how much you study if you are a researcher. It is perfectly fine and acceptable to learn some things, but be careful it's not drawing you in. That's all that this is saying here. And whatever you study should always be filtered through this book right here, the King James Bible. It's reproved, it's made manifest by the light. Right here. Okay? Let's continue on here. Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 20. Second Peter verse, chapter 2. If you read the whole chapter there, it's talking basically about false converts. Second uh, Peter chapter 2 verse 20 says, For after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let me just stop there for a second. It's the knowledge. There are a lot of people that have head knowledge of Jesus Christ and of salvation and everything else, but it never made it down to their heart. But it says, uh, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. <laughs> there are people who get an understanding of the scripture but they just can't leave that filthy lifestyle behind. And they begin to miss it. Why? Oh, I, I sure miss going to that nightclub, and I sure miss going to here and going to there. And a lot of them, you know, I have a ministry. I go hang out at the local bar, you know, <laughs> and I can witness to people. You know, I forget who it was anymore, but some guy was out going door to door or something, and he said he sees this lady coming towards him, and she's wearing a Budweiser t shirt, smoking a cigarette, and she's out passing out tracks. <laughs> Like, uh, <laughs> something's wrong with that picture there. <laughs> the sow that was washed to her wallowing in, her, in the mire. She goes right back to it. There are some people that just like that filthy lifestyle. They enjoy the smoke. They enjoy the alcohol, the feeling. They enjoy the night clubs, the dark places. They, don't, they aren't willing to give that up. And you have to give that up, by the way, if you're a Christian. Okay, you can't have both. Okay, 1 John chapter 1, 
verses 5 through 7. And here's proof that you have to give it up. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. I'm not saying that you have to give up all your sins to get saved. Okay? You come to Jesus Christ and you get saved. And then He, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses you from those sins. And He will help you. Once the Holy Spirit comes in, He can help you to get rid of those, the drinking, the smoking, the everything else. He can help you with that through the process of sanctification. Okay? But if you continue in those things... If you continue to live just like the world and, and do things that are obviously condemned in Scripture, uh, something's wrong. Something didn't quite work out there. Now turn back to Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verses 21 through 27. Here's a description of heaven. And it says, And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Sounds like a pretty clean place. Look at uh, verse 1, 20, chapter 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now there are some parts in this world yet where there are clear as crystal rivers or close to it, but not many. <laughs> I know here in, in Pennsylvania there are not too many rivers that could be considered clear as crystal. Most of them are very filthy and dirty and they have a funny collar and a funny smell to them. <laughs> and... I remember the one time, just a little quick story here, I was fishing with a friend of mine down Susquehanna River, and there was a family came, and they were over a little ways away from us. We were out on the rocks in the, you know, in the middle of the river, and um, I saw this woman changing her baby's diaper, and she takes the diaper and chucks it into the river. And we looked at her like, and we were like, uh, what are you doing? And she looked at us like we had the problem. You know what's your problem? I thought, uh, <laughs> um, you know, you probably don't want to throw a dirty diaper into the river, you know. But that's how people are. They get, you know, we'd see people drinking a soda and they get done and chuck the can into the water. It's not going to happen in heaven. And a lot of those people that are just filthy and dirty and they don't care about things, they don't care about nature. And I'm not, a, I'm not an, an environmentalist, preservationist, or anything like that. But you ought to have some concern. I mean, if you brought it in, some kind of junk food or something, take it with you. You know, the river's not some magical place where you throw things and your trash and it disappears. You know, take it along. Throw it in the trash can. But see, those type of people, those people that are filthy like that, they're going to enjoy heaven. You wouldn't enjoy a place that has a crystal clear river. Okay, but let me continue here. Chapter 22, verse 5 says, And there shall be no night there, and they, sh and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. No night forever and ever. <laughs> no quaint little nightclub to go to with rock and roll music and your favorite band playing that night. Uh-uh. Sorry, not there. Church services... Well, there won't be 24 hours a day, but all the time, worship of the Lamb, all the time, no night, sunny, all the time, 
Everything's clean. See, a lot of people just wouldn't enjoy that. So that's a good reason to go to hell. Now, number five, reason number five. Uh, another good reason to go to hell is if you are miserable and you like to complain. Yeah. There are a lot of people like that. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Okay, Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. That's what the loving Father God, the big guy upstairs, thinks of humanity. <laughs> okay, verse 13. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Oh, God's not sarcastic. Do you realize what he just said there? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine saying that to somebody? You know, your throat is an open sepulcher. <laughs> it's like your breath smells like a, a dead corpse in a grave, essentially is what he's saying there. Amazing. Uh, their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. Let's see where am I reading to here? Okay. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Yeah. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's not a bad thing. Okay. But there's no fear of God before their eyes. That's the problem with the majority of Americans right now. They don't fear God. And by the way, the way of peace have they not known. You're not going to have peace unless you come to Jesus Christ. You can fake it, but you don't have peace. Okay, now, the word miserable, I looked this up, it only appears three times in the Bible, the word miserable. The first time is in Job chapter 16, verse 2, where he calls his friends miserable comforters. <laughs> Which, if you read it, it's pretty accurate there. The second place is in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19, where Paul says that we would be miserable if Christ didn't come up from the dead. We are, we are of all men most miserable, he says. And of course, he goes on to say, but Christ did come up from the dead. The Corinthian believers were starting to believe that they were being told by false prophets that Jesus Christ didn't raise from the dead. And Paul corrects that. That's all that's being said there. But turn to Revelation chapter 3. And you'll see the third instance of who God calls miserable. And this is very interesting. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. Here he's talking to the church of the Laodiceans. A church. Imagine that. Verse 15. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I find that very interesting. Because, see, I was cutting on modern Christians earlier, because they try to serve two masters. And right here, they're neither cold nor hot. Why? They're trying to serve two masters. They're trying to look like the world and look like a Christian. And it can't be done. You're either for God or you're for the devil. Period. There's no in-between. There's no middle ground. you got to be hot or cold. It's plain and simple. And if you're not, God calls you miserable. Okay? Let's see. Now let's go to uh, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 through 5 says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. 
And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. There's not going to be any sorrow or crying or miserable people in heaven. One of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 is joy. Sorry. No miserable, sorry people. And it's interesting too because you look at the modern Christians and it's all the time they're having conferences on how to get along with your wife and how to get along with your family. And it's all feelings, 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 feelings. Why? Because they don't know peace. They don't know the Bible. They, they refuse to submit to the King James Bible. And so it's just all about feeling. The music is all about feeling. You see the people and they got their eyes closed and their hands up and everything. It's all feeling, 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 feeling. Why? Because they're miserable. You can't have joy and peace if you are not a Bible believer. You just can't have it. You know, it's just not going to be there. Okay, now on to the final point. Reason number six that's a good reason to go to hell is if you believe in evolution and sex perversion. Because neither one are going to be in heaven. <laughs> Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16. And this is an event which is very rapidly approaching. I think it's going to happen if not this year, then probably next year. And it's going to happen soon. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, what happens at that catching up that rapture? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 48 says, As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Well, that's evolution. <laughs> well, we're going to see about that. Verse 52, In a moment in the twinkling of an eye, punctuated equilibrium there, um, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Well, I guess you could say we are going to evolve there. <laughs> of course, not in the sense that the uh, evolution theory teaches because it's a supernatural thing. It's not natural. It's not of our own will, you know. But what happens there, uh, what happens when this thing takes to place, or what, what happens there when this thing takes place is, this is the catching up of the believers, the rapture. And at that point, you are changed. You become incorruptible. You become like Christ. And you're that way forever. And when you get to heaven, if you're an evolutionist, and you get to heaven, if you would make it somehow, um, you get up there to heaven, you're changed, you got an incorruptible body, you're going to have to realize that for all of eternity, you're going to be like that. You're never going to get better. You know, you're as good as it gets. <laughs> and, you know, you're in a body that can't feel pain, that, that's, you know, glorified body. You're at the top, okay, which is real hard for you if you're an evolutionist. Okay, now let's go to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, verses 28 through 30. 
Here you have the Pharisees basically trying to tempt Jesus Christ. And uh, basically you have them there. They're trying to pose a question to Jesus that Jesus can't answer. And, you know, then they can trip him up and see, oh, see, we proved him wrong. And, of course, it doesn't work. Uh, but they, they pose a scenario where a man gets married to a wife and then that man dies and the man's brother gets married to this woman and she, he dies and then she goes down through and everything. Verse 28 says, Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Now you study it, you listen to the angel's message, there are no female angels. They're all men. So you're going to get up to heaven there, and you're going to see that in the resurrection, there's no marriage. Okay? And they're not, you know, a bunch of sodomite angels either. Okay? There are no sodomites up there either. Okay? Don't, don't fall for that lie. Sodomy is a sin. And it's not a hate crime. It's just simply, you know, saying what the Bible, or believing what the Bible says. Okay, so there ain't going to be any evolution. There isn't going to be any perversion up there. So where do the perverts end up? Turn to Revelation chapter 21. We went over this verse earlier, but we'll hit it one more time. Revelation 21 verse 8. Okay, Revelation 21.8 says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers whoremongers there, and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Okay, you so see you see the word whoremonger there. Now look over at chapter 22, verse 15. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Now, what is a whoremonger? Well, we're going to go to Webster's 1828 Dictionary Definition of a Whoremonger. Uh, and you have to go through three different words to get the definition. I always hate how they do this. Whoremonger, the same as whoremaster. <laughs> so you go up to whoremaster. One who practices lewdness. So then you go up to whoredom, and it says lewdness, fornication, practice of unlawful commerce with the other sex. It is applied to either sex and to any kind of illicit commerce. So there you have the definition of whoremonger. And how many people right now in, in America are living together and committing fornication, you know, all the time? Well, the Bible calls you a whoremonger. That's something that you can be forgiven of. It's not something that's the unpardonable sin or something like that. But you cannot continue in that. Okay, God is not for that. God, it is perfectly fine and acceptable to marry and to have normal relations. That's fine. But when you say, no, I don't want to have marriage. I don't want the responsibility of marriage. We're just going to live together and commit fornication. No, not right. doesn't work out. So when you get up there to heaven, you're going to see the whoremongers and the sodomites and the evolutionists cast out into outer darkness, <laughs> into the lake of fire. That's where they're going to end up. So if you are a believer in evolution or perversion, you're not going to enjoy heaven. So it's a good place not to go. Okay, now having said that, I just want to talk for just a minute here. I want to go over some facts about hell. Now here at our ministry, we have handed out thousands of these things. Uh, it's a great little track by Dr. Terry Watkins. I referred to him earlier. Uh, of course, everybody here knows it. <laughs> we, we have seen this thing many times, but I think it's good to go over it occasionally. And because I, I was reading through the thing and I thought, you know, I forgot a lot of this stuff. We've handed out thousands of them, but, you know, sometimes we forget what we're handing out. It's called The Truth About Hell. And I just want to read a couple things here. If you are somebody who listened to this message and you say, yeah, I wouldn't want to worship Jesus Christ forever yeah i think i'm good enough you know i don't i'm afraid of what my family's going to think 
I do believe in evolution. And what was the? Yeah, and I'm a pervert, and and you're miserable and like to complain. If you're one of those types of people, then I want to describe your eternal home for you. Okay, hell is a place of fire. It says here in this tract. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses try to teach that hell is the grave. Well, that doesn't work. Um, a man in Luke chapter 16 says, I am tormented in this flame. In Matthew 13, 42, Jesus says, Cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Uh, wailing and gnashing of teeth doesn't happen because you're in dirt. You know, that's somebody being tormented in fire. Matthew 25, 41, Jesus says, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire. It's not going to go out. Uh, Revelation 20.15 says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And the Bible describes hell as fire over 40 times. Now, what about the location of hell? Again, another sad commentary on our day. You ask the average modern Christian, Can you prove to me the existence of hell? They'll say, Well, no. I don't think you can really prove it. It's just something I believe in. Well, actually, most modern professing Christians don't believe in hell. Oh, I don't believe a loving God would create a place. Well, it is a scientifically proven fact that hell exists. Well, where is it? Acts chapter 2, verse 31, Peter says, Seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Now, why did Jesus Christ's soul go down to hell? Well, that's another big study, but they were basically in the Old Testament, the people went to a place called Abraham's bosom, and it was down in the earth somewhere. I don't know where, you know, whatever, but it was down there because in Luke 16, you have the rich man being in hell and he looks over and he sees Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. So it was down there somewhere within sight of hell. Now, you don't go there anymore, but they had to go there in the Old Testament because there was no perfect sacrifice to pay for their sins yet. And so Jesus Christ's soul went down to hell when he was buried in the grave. And he took those saints out. So that is now closed down there. Okay, but that's why his soul went down there. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. Jesus says, So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So you have there in Acts chapter 2, it says that his soul was not left in hell. Matthew twelve forty says that it was in the heart of the earth. So where is the location of hell? Right under your feet. You're sitting on top of it right now. Pretty phenomenal thought. Um, hell is definitely inside the earth. Ephesians 4 9 says of Jesus, Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Okay, now I want to read here a quote from Henry Morris, who's a creation scientist. He says, So far as we can tell from Scripture, the present hell is somewhere in the heart of the earth itself. To say this is not scientific is to assume science knows much more about the Earth's interior than is actually the case. The Great Pit Hell would only need to be about 100 miles or less in diameter to contain, with much room to spare, all the 40 billion or so people who have ever lived. The Birmingham News, April 10, 1987, had an article titled, Earth's Center Hotter Than Sun's Surface. T scientists say, the article stated, Scientists have recently discovered the Earth's inner core has a temperature of over 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, then we go to Caspar Pucer, a famous 14th century scientist who studied volcano eruptions at Hecklefell, recorded some very frightening information in his research findings. He says here, uh, quoting a book here where... Melting the Earth, the History of Ideas on Volcanic Eruptions, page 73, he says, Out of the bottomless abyss of Heclefell, Heclefell, or rather out of hell itself, rise melancholy cries and loud wailings, so that these can be heard for many miles around. There may be heard in the mountain fearful howlings, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, and then he goes on to say, uh, the fearsome noises that issued from some of their volcanoes were certainly thought to be the screams of tormented souls in the fires of hell below. Okay, uh, Revelation 14.10 says, 
and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. Now that's kind of interesting there. What is brimstone? Brimstone is sulfur. And Matthew chapter 8 verse 12 and chapter 2 or 22 verse 13 talk about people being cast into outer darkness. And a lot of people will say, well, wait a second. Whoa, hold on a second. That's a contradiction. Because if it's fire, how could it be darkness? Well, if you burn sulfur, the flame that comes from sulfur, which brimstone is the Bible word for sulfur, the flame that comes from sulfur is basically invisible. It's like a black flame. So if you're down there and it's sulfur that's burning, it would be a black flame. There would be no light. Okay, and it's interesting too. Let me read something here. Did a little research. Uh, people were talking about this thing of um, complete darkness. And uh, this guy is telling a story. And if you've ever been into a cave, they usually do this. It says, The tour guide stopped at one of the deepest points of the cave to give a de demonstration of total darkness. And then he shuts off the lights. Do you ever, how many people here have ever been through that? You go into a cave... And they say, we're going to show you, and they, and they shut off the lights. You can't see a thing. You know, I mean, when it gets dark outside, you know, it'll be dark sometimes. It gets real dark. But you can make out forms and shapes, you know, fairly easily. But when you get underground and the lights go out, you can't see a thing. So imagine being in the heart of the earth in burning sulfur, which produces no visible flame, It'd be outer darkness. And it's interesting because they were talking about it here. And it says, As a bit of trivia, the guide also told us that if one were to stay in total darkness for an extended period of time, the brain would start to react by exaggerating sounds. Water dripping would become conversation, etc. And eventually, full-blown hallucinations. And they go on to talk about it. And doctors are writing in in this article. And they basically said that within... A few hours, maybe two or three hours of total darkness, you'd lose your mind. Now think about that. That's hell. That's what hell's going to be. You'll get down there and you'll be burning and no light and the realization comes into your mind, I didn't have to come here. That tract I threw out, that radio station I turned off, that was my chance. I could have got out of this place. But now I'm here, and I'm not going to get out, ever. I mean, that's, you talk about a nightmare. That's bad. And that's why you had Jesus Christ in uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 43. He said, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life main than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. For it is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. And if, thy, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. That's how serious it is. And yet there are people, the majority of people are going to go there. Why? Because of the six reasons I mentioned. They don't think that they're that bad of people. And they're afraid of what people are going to say about them. That's why. Pretty bad. But let me just finish up here with a little bit more science to prove that hell is a real place. It's right under your feet. It's in the heart of the earth. Okay, it says here, Nature Magazine, July 22nd, uh, 2002, says, Volcanoes may be more like hell than anyone realized. Eruptions disgorge streams of molten sulfur. The brimstone of evangelical preachers, which burns up before it can be preserved for posterity, new research in the journal G Geology shows. And then it goes into a thing here, Discover Magazine, and it has a picture of the heart of the earth being basically a lake of fire. But it's interesting because a lot of these scientists, and you got to watch out for oppositions of science falsely so called, the Bible warns about. First Timothy six, I think that is. Six twenty. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The new versions change it to knowledge. But science, it's it's kind of interesting because a lot of these scientists sometimes you'll get in, honest ones like these guys I was reading, where they actually say, yeah, we heard screams, 
We were there near these volcanoes. We could hear the screams coming out. It's probably hell down there that we were hearing. Sometimes you'll get them that are honest. Other times they start doing the research and all of a sudden they realize, uh-oh, I'm proving the Bible to be true. And they'll try to backpedal. And they'll try, oh, well, you know. And here's a good example of it. I got on this website, and it's like a geology for kids website or something. And, of course, they usually will lie to children. You know, they'll tell them the earth is billions of years old when it isn't. But it says here, at the very center of the earth is the inner core. It is believed to be seven to 900 miles in diameter. The pressure is so great in this layer that it is solid. It is made up of iron and other metals that can be up to 13,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Think about that. <laughs> How can you have a solid core of metal that's 13,000 degrees? <laughs> you know? I mean, see, they just count on people being stupid. It's like me saying, I just built a solid log cabin. And they say, really? Yeah, it's, it's very warm, too. It's 1,000 degrees. <laughs> you know? Uh, no, the wood's going to burn at way less than 1,000 degrees. Iron would not be solid at 13,000 degrees. It's impossible. I don't care what forces or whatever are on it. You aren't going to have iron at 13,000 degrees. I've been doing some research into little uh, furnaces and things like that and uh, smelting type of things, um, iron casting, and steel, well, actually, copper, aluminum melts at, like, right around 1,000 degrees, I think. Uh, copper is about 1,800 to 2,000 degrees. Steel is two to 3,000 degrees. But they're saying here 13,000 degrees. Don't give me that, that, that the iron there is a solid thing and it's 13,000 degrees. Uh-uh, doesn't work. But you see, if they told the truth, then it would prove that the heart of this earth is a lake of fire. So they can't tell the truth. They have to cover it up. They have to lie. But the fact of the matter is, Hell is real. We should not make apology for it. We should not, as Christians, say, well, you know, you can't really prove it. Yes, you can. It's right under your feet, right down there. And if you die in your sins, if you, if you are too cowardly to accept Jesus Christ because of self-righteousness and you're worried what other people are thinking about you, you're going straight down there forever. You're going to be in outer darkness. You are going to lose your mind within about an hour or two. If you're really strong, you might make it to three hours. But most people aren't going to make it. Well, not most people. All people that go down to hell are not going to make it. You will be weeping, wailing, and gnashing your teeth. Because right now you can get saved. There's nothing preventing anybody from getting saved. There's no one on this earth that cannot get saved. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Let me just say before we quit here, um, the NIV has completely removed the word hell out of the Old Testament, and most of the references to hell in the New Testament have also been changed. And that's because most of the translators were probably headed there. you know. And the NIV is basically a Catholic Bible, and the Catholics are headed there. So the new versions are covering it up. The modern churches are covering it up. And it's very, very serious business. You know, I'd, I mean, we can laugh and things because we're saved, we're Christians. You know, we don't, we don't have to worry about hell. But it's really not that funny of a joke, you know. And there are people that use hell as a curse word down here. And this is hotter than hell, they'll say. Uh, no, it isn't. No. Hell is a terrible place. It's a nightmare place. And you say, well, then why would a loving God create it? He didn't create it for you. The Bible says that it was created for Satan and his angels. That's who it was created for. And you, you study what Satan is doing in this world. He deserves to go to hell. And he's going to go to hell and he's going to burn. And I'm going to enjoy seeing him being kicked in there. You're not designed to go to hell. But if you don't accept Jesus Christ, that's exactly where you're headed. Um, we have a salvation message at our website. You can contact us if you want to know about salvation. We would be more than happy to tell anybody how to get out of hell. It's a, it's a place you don't want to go to. And right now, if you're listening to this, you have the opportunity to get out of hell. You don't have to go there. Um, so that's it for this morning. 
Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.